Yeah. It's on live now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then it's only two minutes left, and we should. Yeah. So where are you now? Where are you at present? I'm, uh, yes, I'm based in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Yes. So uh, education has always been a huge yeah. passion of mine. I work in education. I was in, I was in New York yeah. some days ago, actually. Oh, really? Next time you come to D.C., please let yeah, me know. Absolutely. I've been there many, many times. I mean, sure you look out. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I will give you good Bengali food yeah. <laughs> at home. No, that would be great. I would really welcome it if you come to DC. No, I was amazing in New York, obviously. I, mean, I walked Madison Avenue, 25 mm -hmm. streets, and you know, there were 60 shops being closed. Oh my God. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, really. People are working from home and shops are being so it's, it's we are it's felt situation. Okay, so it's forty two forty five. Should we start? We are no one else there. Have you heard from the others? From no, I didn't hear from them. I didn't hear from Andrea or Aditya. Although Andrea's name was listed on the panel. Yeah. Aditya may have dropped off, but but I think we should start. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Shahana Basu, and I'm an international corporate and data privacy lawyer. Currently, I'm serving as a compliance officer in the data privacy office of the World Bank in Washington, D.C., and I'm passionate about education policy issues and have served for many years on the executive board of the Yale Law School and the University of Chicago India Alumni Board. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our panel discussion on new school curricula matching to needs. We have a very eminent panelist here with us today, and I will be chairing and moderating this panel. So just to briefly set the context for this discussion. As all of you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused abrupt and profound changes around the world. This is the worst shock to education systems in decades, with the longest school closures combined with looming recession, and the pandemic has only accelerated existing global inequities in education systems. According to the World Bank, at the peak of the school closures in April 2020, 1.6 billion children were out of school. And according to a Brookings report, by mid-April of 2020, less than 25% of low-income countries were providing any type of remote learning, while close to 90% of high-income countries were providing remote learning opportunities. UNICEF estimates that 463 million children, at least one-third of the world's total, the majority of who are in the developing world, had no chance at any remote learning via radio, television, or online content. However, this does not take into account the creative use of text messages, phone calls, and of offline e-learning that many teachers and education leaders are putting to use in rural and under-resourced communities. Indeed, these innovative practices suggest that the school closures for COVID-19 are perhaps setting the stage for leapfrogging in education. So is this really a leapfrog moment? Can the innovation that has suddenly moved from the margins to the center of many education systems provide an opportunity to identify new strategies in school curricula that if sustained and developed can help young children get an education that prepares them for our changing times. And to discuss this and much more, I want to introduce our distinguished panelist, Pehe Emerson, founder and chairman, Kunskaps Skolen Education in Sweden. And welcome, Pehe, you are an absolute beacon in this area uh, and a storehouse of information. So just to start off, I would love for you to provide some brief opening remarks about yourself, your background, and your philosophy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I 
always been very interested in education as I got a very lousy start in education myself. Um, and um, in Sweden, we have had a very centralized monolithic system uh, that did not, in my the way of my thinking, take into account the fact that human beings are equal but different and learn in different ways. So I actually founded Kunskapsskolan, School and Knowledge School in English uh, 22 years ago. And the idea was to give a personalized education to each one, making sure that each one could uh, do better results than they themselves thought were possible. Um, we have at present about 15,000 students in 25 schools in Sweden and about 15,000 students outside Sweden following this education model. About four or five thousand in India mm -hmm. and then in Holland, UK, US, and Saudi Arabia, actually, at present. So, what happened with the, I think the pandemic can really leapfrog the development of the future because education has always been extremely old fashioned and traditional. If you look at how factories are today compared. Mm -hmm. 50 years ago and then you look at the classroom today and 50 years ago the idea that you put 30 or 35 students in one classroom for 45 minutes and one teacher and reach for the message uh, now we have been forced to use more technology see that human beings learn in different ways so even if there have been lots of difficulties in many places I think this will open up for a very fascinating development, changing education to becoming more efficient and in particular more efficient where it is mostly needed uh, among all poor and aspiring people. Wow, thank you, Behe. That was a really, really great, like 20,000 feet uh, sort of summarizing the key issues, but I want to break it down in terms of first, uh, can you talk a little bit about the challenges? And again, you have the vantage point of seeing not only Sweden, but schools in India, other countries. Uh, what were the challenges faced by students in these different countries with school closures? And given the uh, existing infrastructure, what were the differences in the challenges? Yeah, I think one important difference is that Sweden uh, we never closed down schools during the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. As we adopted a policy, it's better to let people get COVID-19 and mm -hmm. uh, you have to accept that you live with that. And that is an issue in itself. Right. How that worked. But uh, there are some examples today when uh, with the problems in China and North Korea and even uh, New Zealand now, which adopted a different policy that it's very difficult to block it completely. Mm -hmm. so we had a few a few days with blockages of schools, but of course some school children stayed at home more, so that we were not and some of the teachers were ill. So we established a system by a combination of normal training and using uh, technology working from home. And one interesting observation was that we saw a number of students that were not as good when they were at normal schools became much better when they worked online because that was their line way of working, while some others had lots of difficulties to adapt. So to me, it was an illustration how you have to be much more clear as a provider education to see the difference in how people learn. I sometimes say, you know, sometimes you learn when you talk, sometimes when you read, mm -hmm. sometimes when you write, and sometimes when you listen. It's very different models, and some, some are very ambitious, and some are not ambitious. And you can't combine all those into one group. When it was in India and Saudi Arabia, where we had completely closed down for the policy, it was 
much more complicated. So then everyone had to work work online, and particularly difficult when you have the five, six year olds. How do you train people on that, that way? Um, and that was a a uh, much more complicated situation. And I believe that we have more of an uphill battle to get back to normal. We had lost more in the places with complete close downs than with uh, slight clo close downs in, in this. But at the same time, also there we have had the teachers to see how do we develop new methods, how do we change what we have up in the cloud and reach out to people in a smarter way. So I think it's the, as a total thing, I, to be a bit drastic, but I think that uh, the pandemic uh, will result, will lead five years from now to a totally better education than if we did not have had the pandemic because it would increase acceptance of important changes yes. and adaptive of new technology. At the same time, as I'm convinced, you cannot just work online. It's some kind of hybrid models. You have a combination. The mm -hmm. key to successful education is still the good teacher. Mm -hmm. That is the key. To and just to uh, get a little more detail from you, like I'm sure for you when the pandemic hit, it must have been quite like a you had to pivot from you know in person classroom teaching to online in a very very short space of time so to get to have the technology platforms ready enough to go how long did that take you and also in terms of teacher training i mean one thing is the students having to adapt the other thing is teachers also have to now modify their uh, their lessons how they are conveying their information how much teacher training did you have to do and what did the teachers what was their uh, sort of input into the whole thing and the third piece is also parents because with online teaching the parents had to also take a much more active role to make sure that a six or seven year old child is sitting in front of the uh, screen and doesn't get bored and wander off and the parents had to take a you know very active role so would love to get your thoughts on how you manage this whole process i think we we had one advantage and that is the fact that when i started kunska school and then 22 years ago the idea was that we took the different subjects you need to learn during five years of courses. We broke it down in uh, about 40 steps in a very clear way. So you know exactly when you start what you are supposed to achieve. achieve. And then step by step, we put everything on te in teaching modules up in the cloud. And of course, as we have a system where we have both in India, in the UK, in the US, and Sweden, and Holland. A number of those modules, if you get mathematics, are basically the same. If right. you get history, it's different, of course. But then you have, so we, we had, we had a, a system which was using modern technology in, in, a, in a smart way, which meant that when the pandemic came, uh, the students could use that uh, already and the teachers were used to having it and you also have a portal where parents could come in and check so you have very almost a close cooperation mm -hmm. um, in particular i should say that parents in india are much more active than parents in sweden <laughs> and it's very very interesting the concern in, in india the fact of the important education while the tradition in Sweden has been, well, we have paid taxes for this, so it's uh, handled by by the society in a way. Mm -hmm. So, But I, if I compare with other systems, I, I would say the fact that we were working that way gave us quite an advantage, and the fact that our teachers were trained mm. to work that way. But, of course, there were still lots of, of going through retraining your teachers, sharing experiences between various parts and say, how do we handle this in the smartest way? And at the same time, lots of teachers being away because they got COVID. So, you know, we had a lack of staff. And it's the, uh, the, there were 
lots of difficulties in that way. But the fact that we had a basically a a more modernized system uh, was to advantage to our students. Right. And then also there's, you know, there's a lot of research that shows that, uh, that that because of this move to online technology, which was the which was the response, pretty much the universal response across the globe, that there were a lot of differences between countries and within countries in terms of who got access uh, to, uh, you know, online learning opportunities. And it was clear that poorer people, remote um, indigenous and girls also, because there was a big disparity where girls were taken out of schools. And so how do we in a post pandemic world, uh, you know, like you mentioned that these some of these things will continue, but how can we make sure that it's a much more equitable and inclusive system that doesn't uh, sort of disproportionately affect these modernized communities in con- countries where they're already, you know. Um, I, I think you have a very, very important question there. Um, you know, one of the ideas when I've been part of this UNESCO Mahatma Gandhi Institute for Peace and Education about the future of education and where the great principle is that personal education is a human right. And it's also, we are not trying to get the meritocracy, but the important thing is that everyone should be able to improve themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, you have a lots of situations, particularly in, in among poor people and with with young, with females, where you need to uh, put in additional resources now to fill the gap that have been mm-hmm. lost at this time. So I think it's the and it, I think you see lots of variations about that in various schools, uh, depending on how good they have been and how to handle that. So I think that is an overall responsibility to society to make sure that you can fill those gaps. And they cannot only be filled by additional money. Uh, You have to do it in a smart way and say, how do we gain experience? How do we, how do we do this in in a smart way? We are getting our 1500 teachers now to in Sweden together for in a few months time and bringing in some of experience from all the other places we're running schools and say exchange of ideas how did you do it how can we do it how do we improve and there i see in the future more and more of a uh, sharing of global experiences as you know education is not only a national responsibility it's like the climate challenge you know it for us all and education is all for us all so of course we have to make sure that we provide the best possible education everywhere and learn from each other some countries are smarter Mm -hmm. some schools are doing better so how do we share experiences and make sure that we take the benefit of each one's experience to provide a better education and just to follow up on that, Pehe, is, that, is there any evidence-based methods of education catch-ups that you're aware of? That So, for example, do we need more teachers, more recruiting more teachers, busing to regional residential schools? Uh, what, what, what are the methods that, you know, are best practices or lessons learned that are coming out? I think there are so many traditions in this uh, that you see how many teachers do you have? Mm-hmm. I think the first thing is to ask what are the teachers doing? Uh, I think we, we did that at Kronska School when I started. Teachers are there to teach. Hmm. So we took away other things. So our teachers are normally spending 30 hours a week teaching, hmm. while the average in Swedish school is 20 hours. So what the hell are they doing? Right. Uh, you know, it's folk, it, you have to get the focus. The important thing is to educate, to make sure that the student, and then you have to re- get those kind of, of, of right persons. And then you can share experiences. Is how do you do it in that country, in that country, in that country? I think you have lots of opportunities for improvements in, in that area, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and that's why I like to compare them with the 
with the with how industry and others have been doing and doing the changes. You know, it's too. I had a very interesting meeting in Visakhapatnam a few years ago when they talked about how to use gaming in education. Right. How to get when I see my youngest grandchildren play with Angry Birds, and you know they miss, and then they do it again, 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 mm-hmm. again. And the fact, you know, how do you get the fun into education there? Right. Um, just... There are lots of ways where you can, uh, where I, I, I think we are, I haven't got all the responses. I just can see there are, if you have an open mind, uh, I think there are lots of possibilities to improve education and in particular improve it for the money. I absolutely agree with you because I remember in the 80s when I was in India and, you know, like uh, at that time, a documentary filmmaker Manjira Datta had done for the BBC this whole series on, you know, how to use traditional gaming methods for children in villages, you know, like the traditional games they play to help them learn counting and other skills. And I think the modern equivalent of that, as you say, is like video games. I mean, children are so are so, you know, naturally they have taken to that. I mean, this generation of kids are so technologically savvy. And but then there's also the idea of how you know, how much gaming is too much gaming and what are the impacts of gaming and the kind of gaming and what is educational gaming. I think that is a whole different area that needs to be explored. Um, and then also coming back to something you were saying earlier about developing the potential of each child and the capability. The- I mean, this goes with Amartya Sen's capability theory, focusing on potential and really seeing how do you increase that potential opportunity and not merit autocracy in the same sense of that there is that people are not starting from the same baseline or it's not the same starting point uh, and to appreciate that but that also requires pay here a lot of resources because it means more customization more tailoring more sort of seeing a child as an individual as opposed to a standardized you know program that just given to everyone and uh, how would you how would you think about that you know given your vantage point of sweden highly resourced developed economy India, other countries, other countries in the developing world. Uh, and technology, of course, in many ways is a great leveler. But how do you see that delivery system happening in a way? It's a very important question. You know, it's, we have seen too many tendencies that you just bring in online and think that you solve it that way. You, yeah. have, uh, you have to try, find, and um, look at what is the learning structure for each individual and so as we say we we in my school we talk to each student the, the teacher one teacher talks 15 minutes every week you know what are you doing what are you thinking very serious discussion very few parents have serious discussion 15 minutes every week with our children about uh, the things like so we try to identify what is the important thing and try to design it that way. I think it's it's an interesting talking point. I think that could be very much improved and done so much better. Uh, but we see very good results from doing that. In the same way, we see very good results when we let our children in, in India chat with uh, children in the UK. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let them talk about what happened when India became a free country. There are different uh, curriculums in India and, and in the UK about that. You you see things in different ways, uh, and I think it's uh, that having the education as a catalyst for increased global understanding. But then I'm back to the fact you have a teaching provider realize that each one is different. And how do you make the best possible setup for mm-hmm. everyone? And and then you have to be flexible about how you combine technology and traditional teaching teaching skills. 
And also on that, I mean, we're talking a lot about online education, but I mean, there are also so many other aspects of in-person teaching that doesn't happen only in the classroom. When you attend a school, you have, you know, your peers, you have your physical activities, you have other music, you have so many other activities and the social interaction itself, which is very valuable. And, and there's a lot of research that is showing that the children are actually at a disadvantage of their emotional, psychological well-being and growth. And how are schools addressing that and what what again how do we catch up on that for the uh, for these students who've lost so much in the last two and a half years that, that's right when i go in one of schools you can see sometimes you have 60 people listening to something or sometimes they're sitting three or four but we base ourselves very much where you as a student has to assume a bit more responsibility than the others. So I think we are as best with those that are very good and those that are not as good. There are other better pedagogical ideas, and, and I think that's the important thing that you can choose between those. Mm -hmm. I had a parent who told me once, you know, my daughter goes to your school and my son goes to another school and I could they can't switch. Right. And the other more, more traditional, uh, you, you really know exactly what to do when you follow some rules. So I think you have to increase that kind of understanding uh, that you can't have one size fits all model, no. which is very, that is in most educational systems, that is tradition for, for the politic, politicians. We, we should provide this and this and this as a system. And then you have a few students that go to private schools that, uh, that are completely different, different where they can have. So I think that's we we are looking at a, a major change. And that was the, the work with, with this UNESCO, Mahatma Gandhi, and she was extremely interesting because, of course, when you talk, we don't like meritocracy. Mm -hmm. The other people say, well, that is a key for everyone should be able do something. I said, well, no, we have potentiality. Each one should be able to develop best. That's the, and, and it's not a matter for politicians say, okay, we need that many doctors and let's see they can compete and then we get the number we need. You know, no, no, that's not the way I see it. It's a, how do each one get its own potentiality and so you don't get 100 that win and then 50 that lose and, and mm -hmm. they get the right kind of start for their life in, in a proper way. Wow. So I'm talking about a hypothetical, I mean, in the optimistic scenario, you know, no more variants, <laughs> pandemic ends, I mean, and every, every, the world, every, everything is open. What would you see? Like, what, what have we learned from this lesson in education systems that will continue? And what do you think will go away? And also what kind of, a, what are your suggestions for a post pandemic new school curriculum? I think we have, we have, Sometimes we've seen bad things. You see, with the development in China, mm -hmm. we're taking away alternatives and a dramatic change uh, where you really get back and say, this is the way you should learn and this is the messaging. Same we can see in Russia at present, which is a... a uh, and you can also see it, I should claim, in some, some of the tendencies in the US uh, about the schools and what what mm -hmm. are teachers allowed to teach and not teach uh, which to me makes it even more important in, in the future in the democratic world to make sure you have alternatives uh, you know we also in Sweden we have a very interesting system because Sweden is I think the only country where education is paid for by taxpayers and everyone can choose you don't need to choose rich parents right uh, it's completely, the, everyone has the right to choose a government school or a non-government school, and it's paid for our taxpayers' money, uh, which is fairly unique, where you get more of a blend of different kinds of people, not like in other countries where those that are rich and with traditions, they pay for their own schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe this is an, 
important long-term goal that I see in part of, of making sure that education will be provided to everyone and that is a common responsibility for us in society as taxpayers to make sure that that happens. And that, of course, is a long-term, uh, very long traditions while you have had your separate systems for different groups. Uh, but I think that's the... I, I see that as one long-term goal, and the same long-term goal is to make sure that you have education running between nations and not only being controlled by those that are elected in each specific nation, but you see it really as uh, educating a global generation. That is really interesting. And I'm curious, Pehe, like when you said that they can parents can choose between public schools or private schools, that, that means that... At the core, there must not be that much of a difference is between private and public schools. Because in the U.S., for example, like schools are based on the district you go to and it's funded through the district and people and private schools are considered much better in terms of quality of education. The teachers, you know, they become sort of uh, funnels to Ivy League schools. You have riding and, horse, you know, horse training and music and all these other advantages which public schools don't have. So it's really different. But when you have a choice, does yeah, it we have the, the same. We, we actually in Sweden, we get the same amount of money that each uh, that is being paid for government schools goes to independent schools. And an independent school is not allowed to charge one dollar extra. Um, which, of course, I, I, I had academies in the UK a few years ago. You know, we got seven thousand pounds at that time. Right. And I was, we had a private schools. 10 minutes from us, and they short 25,000 pounds. So they asked me, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, what are you doing? I'm going giving good education to 7,000, and you are spending 25,000. What the hell are you doing with the money? You, know, it's the, uh, you have to also be responsible and, and be efficient when you try education. So that is more of a part of keeping the old class society. That's the, the uh, if, if, if I'm uh, a bit uh, uh, harsh in my, in my statement. And that, of course, lots of tradition in many, many countries like that. So um, that's what I see the, always trying to, to tell, let's make sure we all have a com common responsibility to do this, and, and then we should give the same chance, to, not only to those that can afford lots of money. At the same time, you have to make sure that you you use the money in a smart way. You know, it's, it's the, uh, I think that's a responsibility for everyone to do that. And I also wanted to ask about, you know, following up, like, what about the another big community is like migrant children? I mean, you have a huge amount of migration patterns now because of the wars. And, and, and so, you know, how is, is remote and online training and technologies? I mean, how are they going to access these kids? I mean, that's the other whole, you know, that the it's reason. A, it's, a big, it's a big challenge. You know, we, in Sweden, I think we had more immigrants than any other country compared to the population when we got mm -hmm. 2015, 2016. And we opened up our schools to immigrants. And uh, I think the experience was if you got the number of them, it worked. But mm -hmm. if you got too many at the same time, other left. You know, it's the, you, you have to... It's very, very difficult if you don't if you get too many at this stage, and then you have to to find other ways of education. So that is a, a no solutions in, in at present there. And now we are getting lots of immigrants, of course, from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are trying putting together systems for education there too. It's easier because they have closer to our traditions than when they mm -hmm. came from Somalia or, or Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But it's an issue very much discussed here, and uh, and I think it's an issue that will be very much discussed in the future too. How do you, which right will you have to have your own uh, mm -hmm. traditional backgrounds, or do you 
as in the U.S., when you move there, you have to be American, or do you know? So we have, we actually have in Sweden, you keep the right to have your mother tongue language. We educate, we we provide everything there, and then that is, of course, an advantage. But at the same time, if you move here to a new country, it's good to get part of that society too. Uh-huh. So we have lots of different discussions about that. Uh, and have not been, as a country, that successful. Right, because that leads to all the other things, right? Like technologically, then you'll have to do it in different languages. Teaching methods have to be then, you yeah. know, uh, there's a whole other piece to it is how do you actually deliver in different I languages. think we have learned more now. And I think, it, you know, we're looking at Ukraine and all those coming and, and teachers are coming and we are put together a special mm-hmm. system. You know? So I think that also there, technology... Right. Can help, and uh, so, but you have to use it in a in a smart in a smart way, and that's the unknown from experiences there too. And the other group, which is very vulnerable, are disabled is with people with disabilities, children with disabilities. I mean, in the U.S., that was one of the big things that when schools opened, like even when other schools hadn't opened, like uh, special education teachers were were asked to go back to schools because, you know, children with disabilities could not, you know, learn otherwise. So how is, how are countries... We, we started that? The, the fifth school I started in, in Sweden was one for those with disabilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a small school, only 20, 25 students. But at the same time, if you have an educational model, that is very personalized. It helps to take those with mm. different learning skills. You know, I think we have quite a few uh, with what you call combinations of, of, of language with, that have difficulties that we have been able to handle. Um, and that's also one of the one of the points we have been working on closely in. in uh, in the Emirates of Saudi Arabia has actually to put up a, a school mm-hmm. of that kind of, of uh, using our experience in building a special needs school. Mm-hmm. Uh, also be working on a special program in Canada for STEM and for the indigenous people where you have got, uh, enormous backlog in education and mm-hmm. enormous responsibilities for politicians. So how do we find ways to reach out and get a, a, a function education there? And uh, there you have, it's no question that there are n- not only the challenge of getting resources, there are lots of cultural challenges also to, to do that. That's the, in, in, the, in a functional way. But I think that those are, it's interesting, when I started with this working financial education, those things were not really discussed. Now it comes up everywhere when I come and I talk about how can we do something for that group, for that group, for that group where we have missed. Right. And then uh, my other question to you is that, you know, you mentioned something about that, that money is not enough, that it's not just resources, you need other things. So if you had to make your ask of the global community what you need, what would that be? Now I'm back. <laughs> yes. Pehi, should I repeat the question? I will have a, a digital disruptor. Yes. Rufus, welcome. Should I invite him to join us on stage? If he has any questions, Rufus. Rufus. Yeah, he wants the mic. Give him the mic. Yeah, I gave it to him. Rufus? Rufus, you have the mic. Rufus, I've invited you to the stage. Here. Hi, Rufus. 
Hi guys, sorry <laughs> late night here. Uh, you're also in Sweden, Peje. Yeah. Uh, I was not expecting this. No, I was just wondering about uh, you, when you started this uh, uh, talk, we were talking about the, the children that uh, all the other benefits that comes with the offline school compared to the online school. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, true and, and scientifically proven, of course. Um, and uh, and, and very, very, it, 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 talking with with, the, with your your heart, that is very true. But then you have all these children that don't have access to school at all. Mm. So I, I, it's a kind of luxury uh, reflection. So because all of these that don't have, uh, is it wouldn't it be? Isn't it um, uh, our obligation to to really use all technology that is possible, all the emerging technology to make make possible for all these billions of of, of children? Uh, to make make education possible, if you have a smartphone and motivation, and mm -hmm. you, we have five billion smartphones in the world right now, make possible also for them to have an education that is uh, at least a little bit more engaging, a little bit more more simple, and more efficient. Uh, I'm 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 talking more like a prag pragmatist here than 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 than. An, no, but absolute. Of course, you're right. Though. It is no question. And if I see, I. I mentioned what we are doing in in, um, uh, in a number of villages uh, north of Ind north of Delhi, uh, where we have uh, online training, uh, very specific. But we also have a number of teachers that, of course, could be more experienced, but they are there. It's not, it's n not only online; it's kind of a combination, uh, but it's. At the same time, no question that some students are extremely good at just doing it online. You have to say, well, how do you balance the hybrid? And I put together a concept a few years ago about uh, really the school of the future, where it was more a big arena where people came in four or five hundred for an hour, and then they went home and were sitting in their rooms online and came back. You know, it's the... Uh, uh, how much time can you do you need to be alone and how much when you need to interact? And I think the, in the long term, of course, you will get more and more of, online uh, as we do in normal work. Uh, but that, that's the step-by-step process, how we, how we see it. But in particular, in areas, uh, enormous poss possibilities to increase education uh, rapidly. There, I think there's two two aspects here because what, one aspect is is uh, the value of the teacher uh, that shouldn't be diminished. But if, if you have the possibility for a teacher to not reach twenty twenty children but reach uh, twenty thousand children, mm -hmm. uh, that is fantastic. No, uh, and uh, so so that's one aspect. The other aspect is I think it was uh, you're you're touching that uh, Peje. Uh, the the possible some some children uh, are so so much better than us uh, on understanding how how to if you do an airdrop in in the middle of Ghana uh, of of uh, mobile phones uh, nobody has to to tell them how Instagram is working or how how TikTok is working they know this much better than us so if we can make an education programs that that are so simple uh, the format are so simple and even even fun and engaging. That would be a, the, the, then we would be now we, we develop a, an Einstein every hundred years and one Elon Musk every tenth year. Then it, we would uh, unrealize all these potential in, in in the middle of Africa or in Chennai or whatever uh, for for children mo motivate, uh, yeah. motivated motivated uh, that would have the possibilities that like never we never had the chance before. You guys, you know, if you look at offices now. I don't know if it's in the in DC, but I see New York, forty uh, percent. You are supposed to be in the office not more than three days a week, mm -hmm. uh, so you are combining work from home, and you will change the whole office structure in doing that, obviously. Uh, and you learn more and more to sometimes you sit home and work online, and mm -hmm. sometimes you meet people. And then how do you get the right kind of blend that? Of course, it can be so extremely more efficient. You have seen how traditional corporations have been much more efficient during the pandemic because you have skipped doing things that you were not needed. So that's why I think it can really improve improve possibilities and and uh, 
also you are also right to see the enormous differences is how some other countries than Sweden are far advanced in how they use the modern technology. You know, they are leap taking us steps ahead of that. Well, we have in, in, in Southeast Asia, we have uh, seven hours a day being used on the internet and three of them is within uh, within social media. What what if we, you, you would use 20% of these uh, that you're using for social media for education instead? That would be a leapfrog of, 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 uh, of learning uh, in, in these uh, in countries with, you know, 100 million of, of, of inhabitants. So absolutely amazing if we could do, yeah. receive that. Yeah. But there you, have, there you have to fight too much for this. I've been trying to convince a few governments to uh, take a school. We can have use the school for the double no, uh, number of students because mm -hmm. some could start at 10 o'clock in the morning and then some in the mm -hmm. afternoon. And then they can spend some time doing things from home, from their smartphones. As well. How do we use the premises in the most what way and upgrade the possibilities instead of building fantastic locations for schools for the very rich people with <laughs> you know that's what they told me in the UK when I said well you shot 25,000 and then they said but of course we have some free students and I said yeah, of course you you give to those that can run fast and think fast and in that way you talk to people right. in the upper class <laughs> and then we have teachers that uh, don't teach very much, but they think a lot. And then we have very bad, very old premises. And then I said, but and then if, in case we we have too many that would like to go here, so we make more money, and then we can buy a new cricket field. Mm -hmm. yeah. Field, you know. <laughs> I just want to, because we're coming to the end of our time, I just want to wrap up the session. I think we can continue talking later, but uh, just formally to thank Sahe for a wonderful session. You are such a fountain of knowledge and so much information to share. It has been really a great, great uh, session. And thank you, Rufus, for jumping in with your questions. And I think we all agree on an optimistic note that this perhaps a moment for leapfrogging in education has come. And uh, all the very, very best, uh, Pehin, leading this charge uh, on behalf of the global community and harassers. So thank you. Thank you very much, John. And thank you, Rufus. Yeah, I like your title, Digital Disruptor. When I've been to many governments, I said, I'm here to disrupt your education system. Ah, okay. <laughs> Good, Pehin. Very thank nice you. session, and Shahana. Very, very nice. Thank Have a good you. Time. Yes.